pile of bicarb, or is it cocaine? It's bicarb. So I tried to film this video while I had COVID really bad, and it's just the most low energy, saddest thing that I've ever filmed, so we're gonna do a take two. Before we jump into the jewellery side of things, I just want to mention that I have been on a podcast. It's called the Bread and Thread Podcast. So if you want to go and check that out, I highly recommend it. I think you can just grab it on Spotify. It's well worth a listen. You will learn things. There are recipes. There are fabulous bits of academic insight. It's a great podcast. So thank you very much to the guys for having me on. Mm. I can taste that. It's amazing. So loads and loads of people have asked me to do a video about Viking jewellery, but the thing about Viking jewellery is we have tens of thousands of pieces of it, so if I were to do a video singular on Viking jewellery, the damn thing would be like two and a half hours long, and I am in the game of making like half hour long YouTube videos rather than making two and a half hour long YouTube videos. So I'm not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> instead, I'm going to make a video about one of the most common kinds of Viking jewellery people buy as reenactors, which is brooches. Am I covering that entirely with my finger? Brooches. Clarity. So brooches are hugely popular pieces of reenactment jewellery. And there's a very good reason for that. We have more than, well, we actually have more than, I think, 4,000 just of this kind, just of the tortoise brooch, that we found. So they're a really, 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 really popular accessory. Because they're a very common artifact. Now, Viking Age brooches come in several different shapes, and we're going to talk about them. And we're going to talk about them. We are going to talk about disc brooches, we're going to talk about equal armed brooches, we're going to talk about three armed brooches, we're going to talk about penannula brooches, and we're going to talk about tortoise brooches. So, we will begin by talking about the disc brooch. So the disc brooch is, I mean, it's effectively a pin badge, really, right? And they are used throughout the Viking Age, and earlier and later, by a variety of different peoples, and some of the more popular styles that you see in the Viking Age <clears throat> uh, include the really sort of I'm moving my tea out of the way uh, the really Anglo-Saxon looking ones that have sort of little figures and little pictures of people on them in very English style so you tend to see these more in the British Isles and specifically they're very popular in Anglo-Saxon England however they do turn up elsewhere, but Norse disc brooches are another matter, and they do exist, they were a thing, they were made. Um, I think we have finds from Gotland and Denmark and Norway of brooches in Norse art style. And when I say Norse art style, I mean one of the sort of six Viking art styles. Um, so things like... Osseberg style, Ringerica style, Ernest style, Yellinger style, Mammon style, and so on. And editing Jimmy, I'm sure we'll put a little timeline of the Viking art styles up on here, because COVID sucks. <coughs> <coughs> I'm still not 100%. Oh, the sun's gone. Oh no, my exposure. I only work for exposure. And cash. And a sack of French porn. So we do have Viking disc brooches and they tend to be sort of covered in gripping beast style motifs and um, the gripping beast if you're not aware of it is one of those sort of stereotypically viking art designs um, does this have gripping beasts it does have gripping beasts where you ha you'll have a beast so you've got this little face 
and he'll have a little hand and he's gripping with his little hand see his little fingies he's gripping he's gripping away that is kind of one of the stereotypical things that you see on Viking Age art everywhere is this gripping 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 beast motif uh, I think Reba style is kind of the the one that's like everything is a cute teddy bear that's gripping stuff anyway disc brooches so disc brooches are as far as I'm aware um, one of the least popular kinds of brooch in terms of uh, Norse Scandinavia. They're popular elsewhere. The Carolingians love a disc brooch, especially a one that has a one, especially one that has nice cloisonné enamel work on it. There's a piece of fluff on my mic and it's really annoying. So if you're portraying an Anglo Scandinavian or an Anglo Carolingian or just a Carolingian of Frank, um, a guy called Frank, a disc brooch might be a nice option for you. If you are an Anglo-Saxon, a uh, nice big fuller disc brooch might be another nice option for you there. The next kind of brooch that we're going to talk about is probably the most popular kind, penanula brooches. So everybody loves a penanula brooch. If you saw my How to Wear a Medieval Cloak video, you'll know that they're super simple and versatile to use. And chainmail on my yarm helmet is getting on my nerves. Um, they're really, really fun to wear. They look amazing. They're really nice. And they come in oodles of styles. So there's this kind of theory that the Norse who came over to Britain and Ireland saw these amazing penanula brooches and went, Oh my god, these are amazing. We must take them home immediately. Uh, no, probably not. Um, they were almost certainly already aware of penanula brooches as a system of fastening. And found the art style that the Irish and the Britons were using on their brooches really attractive, took that home and went, aren't these pretty? Um, we will make our own. That's how they talked. Shut up. I know how they talked. One of those things... Um, <coughs> <coughs> so it's one of those things that kind of catches on and becomes hugely fashionable and <clears throat> right the way through the Viking Age you see people using penanula brooches, uh, various art styles and types. You get very simple bronze ones, which are literally just a bar uh, of sort of roughly round profile with a ring, uh, a, a pin with a little clasp over it, and that's it. That's boom, job done. Um, you get some made of silver. We've got hundreds of penanula brooches and bits of made of silver. Um, you see the occasional one that is made of gold or that is gilt uh, and that is decorated with gems or glass beads or um, interesting chip carving or uh, enamel work with uh, gold filigree work placed into an additional plate that's then riveted into a cast bronze or silver Penanula brooch, you know, you get all of these kinds of things. And then you get the magnificent thistle brooch. So the thistle brooch is a penanula brooch with sort of stylized thistle flowers decorating it. Makes sense. These guys are, I think, more of a sort of, um, more of a sort of Irish, Scottish, Welsh... Irish Sea sort of area uh, find in terms of where we get them. And <clears throat> if you're looking to go sort of slightly safer, um, you could get a plain penanula brooch. The one that I have is actually one of the, <laughs> one of the rare cases where um, something that I just bought on one of these big reenactment stuff websites is actually based off an Irish find. The actual find itself looks pretty much just like this, but it's made of solid silver. So you can go for a cheap version, you can go for a small version, and these things came in all kinds of sizes. I mean, I think the smallest ones we get are like sort of that big, kind of two inch, one and a half, two inch sized pieces. Um, some of the bigger ones have a foot long pin. I'm not exaggerating, there are examples in the Irish National Museum in Dublin, the National Museum, where the pin of this pin on your brooch is a foot long, like 
stupidly big. Uh, in Ireland, they were used as a symbol of wealth, but they were also used as a symbol of loyalty. So they were gifted by kings and nobles. Um, they were occasionally used as stabbing weapons. Um, there is a legendary piece of Irish law somewhere that limits the length of the pin on your brooch, but I can't remember where. I'm sure somebody will be able to educate me in the comments. But <clears throat> the point is, these things come in all shapes and sizes. They've been used since the Romans. They are a hugely popular kind of brooch. So, effectively, for anyone in the Viking Age, a penannular brooch would be a nice shiny to have. You don't necessarily need to have a solid silver, like, eight inch wide thistle brooch with a foot long pin jabbing out of your cloak, <coughs> unless you are an Irish or you're a Hiberno Norse nobleman or something, you can make do with a small cast bronze or even, like, you know, hammered iron piece just to hold your cloak up. That's fine. That's totally cool. Don't worry. So, Equal armed brooches. These guys are interesting, and I wasn't really aware of these as a find until I started reenacting. Um, but they're fascinating things. They seem to fall out of favour, I think, in Denmark at least, sort of towards the 10th century. <sighs> but they are spectacular looking pieces of jewellery. They're really interesting, they're really cool, and from what we can tell, they're more popular with women. Um, this is one of those few times where there is gendering involved in what I do a video on. A lot of the time, the stuff that I talk about is relatively loosey-goosey. But in jewellery terms, men seem to prefer a disc brooch or a penannula brooch. Women, on the other hand, seem to be quite fond of all of these types of brooch that we're going to talk about today. But the equal armed brooch seems to be quite a quite a Scandinavian thing. So rather than being particularly common in, in Britain and France and Ireland and elsewhere in the Viking world, this one seems to be quite a Scandinavian thing. Uh, and a fairly early one. So if you are an 11th century Danish noblewoman, you're probably not going to be wearing one of these. They kind of fall out of fashion by the 10th century. So maybe go for something like, uh, you know, an, if you're an 11th century Danish noble, rather like a nice earnest style gripping beast brooch or something, I don't know. Um, but they seem to be quite high status. A lot of the ones that we found are very intricately made, um, quite highly decorated, silver, gold, that kind of thing. So they seem to be quite reach. Oh, there's so much tea on this video. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is these um, these sort of three-armed brooches. And these guys are really cool. I really like these guys. And one of the theories behind them that I think is borne out in the archaeology is that they are based off Frankish and Carolingian sword fittings. So if you see the sword fitting in this manuscript here, you'll see that it looks strikingly similar to this lovely brooch that was found in East Anglia in England. And these guys seem to, again, be less favoured by the 10th century, 11th century. They seem to sort of flop a little. Um, again, these seem to be favoured more by women. And they're really interesting. So they are sort of clearly based off this, uh, this sword fitting that somebody saw and went, wow, that's really pretty. Um, I bet if I took the back off that and put a brooch fixing on it, that would make a really nice piece of jewellery and caught on, which is really fun that that sort of evolved like that. Um, <clears throat> so you do see these all over the place. You see these in Scandinavia, you see them in Britain, you see them all over the shop. They're quite popular. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Some of them are huge and silver and gold and encrusted with the most wonderful carving decoration uh, and riveted extra bits and bobs. Some of them are small crappy pieces of bronze that are literally just there to hold your dress up. So, depends on who you are. We do see them uh, being worn by women and children. Um, They're worn by children, which is nice. It's interesting to see stuff in children's graves as well. So there doesn't really seem to be much of an age limit on these, but like I say, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they're kind of good mid-period 
jewellery for if you're looking for something interesting that maybe not everybody in your group has. They don't seem to be as well represented in um, the reenactment world just yet, for whatever reason. It takes a while for things to appear and, and kind of um, kind of be well represented in reenactment after they've been discovered and popularised. Hey, maybe I'm helping out. So the next thing we're going to talk about is these guys, the tortoise brooch. So these are really interesting. Like I said at the start of the video, we found more than 4,000 of these guys. Some of them are matching, some of them are mismatched. Um, some of them are made of bronze, some of them are made of silver, some of them are made of gold, some of them have a decoration that seems to be more popular in sort of Eastern Scandinavia, and some of them have decoration that seems to be more popular kind of towards the Western side of the Viking world. Um, which, by the way, is what people mean when they say Eastern versus Western Viking, and a lot of it is a little bit mushy and grey, and it's a bit of a reenactorism, so... With them, that's a whole other unpleasant stew for us to pick the gristle out of at some point. But tortoise brooches do fall out of favour. They're not just this ubiquitous all the way through medieval history thing. They are popular in this form by the 8th century, and, or by the end of the 8th century, I should say, and then they fall out of favour by the end of the 10th century. So they're not everywhere forever. They kind of get decorated in a variety of styles, depending on which style of art is popular at the time. You'll find an Osberg style tortoise brooch, or you'll find a Ringerica style tortoise brooch. <laughs> it might be decorated with uh, lobes of silver riveted through it. It might have a double shell. It might be decorated with gold. It might be carved intricately. Uh, it might be a tiny little heap of crap, a couple of inches tall, made of bronze, or it might be made of silver and gold. It depends who you are, when you are, how wealthy you are. These are quite specific Norse items. So they are a part of the sort of classy looking Norse woman's uh, ensemble. Men don't wear these. We don't find men wearing them. These are ladies' wear. They are, as far as we can tell, probably fairly formal or classy. We don't know if they were worn every day. A lot of people are now thinking probably not. Um, in sort of Livonian areas in the Baltic, you see a different style of oval brooch with chains and then kind of chain separators with even more chains suspended from them. Um, that's a totally different look to what you see being worn in most of the Viking world with these brooches where you have just an oval brooch at each shoulder and then you'd have maybe a string of beads or a few strings of beads. Uh, you can also suspend your knife and tweezers and bits and bobs and snips and whatever you have suspended from them, so they're quite useful items. They are sometimes mismatched, so you don't necessarily have to have a matching pair. If you find a merchant who will sell you a mismatched pair of tortoise brooches, good for you. You might be able to commission a private artist or jeweller. More on that in a second. In terms of other brooches that you see, you see things like animal head brooches in Gotland. Uh, some people will tell you they've never been found anywhere else. This is a lie. Uh, we have at least one find of an animal head brooch from the UK. Box brooches are another quite uh, northeastern European thing. More popular amongst the Rus. Uh, you have things like four-lobed brooch in this intriguing style from the Galloway Horde uh, that seem to be slightly more popular than initially thought, but are extremely rare find in terms of the archaeology. Uh, you have ringed pins, which are used as a brooch, and they're very popular in places like Ireland and uh, the western parts of Britain. Bird-shaped brooches, which again seem to be based off uh, a Frankish style of zoomorphic brooch that becomes popular elsewhere in the Viking world. So you do have other types of brooch to choose from, but the thing to remember with all of these styles is, think about who you are when you're reenacting. So are you reenacting a Welsh nobleman? In which case, you are not going to be wearing tortoise brooches. You're more likely to be wearing a big fancy penannular brooch. Are you an Anglo-Scandinavian noblewoman of the later 10th century? In which case, you might not be wearing tortoise brooches either, and you might have a big Anglo-Saxon-style disc brooch uh, to close 
your sort of monthly head lady. Monthly head lady is the technical term. Um, if you are a late 8th century, early 9th century Danish Viking, you may very well have uh, a couple of tortoise brooches that you have just had commissioned. Or you may be wearing an equal armed brooch, or who knows? There are lots of options. Obviously cross-cultural contact is a lot more common than a lot of people think uh, and have thought. People from Dublin went to Scotland, to Scandinavia, to France, back to Dublin. Like, people travelled a lot if that was their job, and they took things with them, and they traded things, and they moved art styles around Europe. Things chipped and changed and, and went all over the place. But if you are wearing something that is as sort of culturally distinct as a Norse apron dress, chances are you're going to be wearing tortoise brooches with it and a string of beads. Nice nah, string of beads. I should do a video on beads. So be careful with what you buy. And every single website out there will tell you that their stuff is based off a of find. Look for the find. Ask them which find. Ask them where it's from. If it just says Birka, ask them which grave in Birka. <laughs> Birka, sorry. If it says, you know, this is based off a find from Fishamble Street in Dublin, just Google Fishamble Street brooch, and if that turns up, you're onto a winner. If you have a friend or a trusted trader who is trusted trader, um, a master jeweller or silversmith, commission them to make you exactly what you want if you can afford it and you want to it's a great way to get exactly the piece of jewelry that you want and if you say i want a norse tortoise brooch if they're good they'll say cool which find do you want it based on if it's somebody like adam parsons over at blue axe reproductions he will make the best quality reproduction jewelry based off a of find that you've ever seen if it is some random internet website where they have 50,000 different products on their site, you are kind of taking your chances. But the important thing to remember here is this depends on your budget for the hobby. My first couple of Penanula brooches, very small, basically brass wire. My current one is a nice, okay, bronze, but copy of a silver find. So it's based on a find. It looks exactly like the find unless you flip it over. Shh, don't tell anyone and it's much better quality. So, and that's after years in the hobby. So, if you want a gold and silver encrusted equal armed brooch for your Norse impression, that's absolutely fine. But maybe work up towards that, and until then, just get yourself a 20 pound disc brooch or something. It's totally fine, we have finds on that sliding scale that go from legit royalty jewellery to a little bronze piece of crap. Genuinely. Like, not everybody has to have the incredible silver finery for every single event. And why not have something smaller, something commoner, something for a commoner? Why not have that? And that way you can adapt and you can change your impression. And if two of you arrive at an event with the same piece of jewellery, you can change. Firm believer here in having lower status and higher status impressions. I think it helps you get to know the period, I think it helps you get to know what's out there, and helps you get to know what we've found, and it gets some more of these obscure finds. So in terms of finding where you can get examples of this jewellery, finds.org.uk, the Portable Antiquity Scheme in the UK, um, museums, the National Museum of Denmark, the National Museum of Norway, uh, the National Museum Archaeology in Dublin, the National Museum of Wales, the National Museum of Scotland, the British Museum, you see where I'm going, are fantastic, but be careful. There are finds in the British Museum labelled as Viking 12th century. We all know that the Viking Age ended in around 1066, so that's not Viking, is it, BM? Do better. Be careful. You can't really rely on any website to give you all of the information you need. So please be careful when you're out there researching for this next amazing piece of jewellery. You guys are more than capable of putting in the legwork, but I get a lot of people asking me to fully research their stuff for them. I'm not going to do that because 
the research is part of the hobby, and I would charge a lot of money. So no, <laughs> I'm not going to help you research all of your Viking impression for you. I'm sorry, it's part of the hobby that you should enjoy. If you don't enjoy researching the impression that you're doing, I don't know what to tell you. So, go out there, do a little bit of research on your finds, on your beads, on your jewellery, on your knife, on your sword, and you're going to put together an impression that you know from the inside out. And that, I think, is something you can be really proud of in reenactment. So, Dich Marion, I'm a Minna in Noetheta. I hope you enjoyed this video. I need to go and lie down, and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for all of your kind words whilst I've been sick. Uh, I am getting back into the swing of things. Stay safe, take care, COVID-19 sucks, and... Now we'll control this We'll have a draw. Three miles in chainmail and I broke a sweat sign a chair. Yowza! Yeah,